Hey, welcome to the 224th episode of Just Shoot It, a podcast about filmmaking, screenwriting, and directing. This episode is brought to you by patrons Tony Yacenda. Thanks, Tony. I'm Matt Enlow. And I'm Oren Kaplan, and today we have George Edelman of No Film School on the podcast. He is a filmmaker slash businessman <laughs> slash editor but the website kind not the film kind though i'm sure probably a little bit of the film kind as well yeah so he is one of the brains behind no film school which uh do you follow them on social media matt yeah pretty avidly they have really uh, wasted a lot of my time <laughs> <laughs> in a good way in a good way educated you i think is maybe another way of saying it uh we talked to george a lot about the nature of creating media and what it means to work for no film school but more importantly i bet to you dear listener we talk about what it takes to pitch george and get your film featured on no film school we're talking about their twitter feed their instagram feed their front page their facebook all of that stuff so if you want a little bit of extra exposure from no film school listen to the things that we talked with george about along with a ton of other fascinating insight. Yes, and just to be clear, when I say no film school wasted my time, it's just because they have so many articles that I cannot... Can't take it back. Can't take it back, I cannot wait to read. Yep. George, you heard it here first. So if you want to know about not going to film school, which I would argue that I am an expert at, this is the episode for you. Before we talk to George, I'd like to remind everyone that we have a Patreon page, patreon.com slash justshootitpod, and it is a place where if you want to throw a few dollars to the podcast... You should. I've noticed there's kind of a lot of people doing Patreon nowadays. So if we are low on your list of people you want to patron, I understand. But if uh, we're in your top five podcasts, just go to patreon.com slash just shoot it pod. Check us out. If you give us 10 bucks, we will give you a just shoot it podcast hat, which is all the rage. We even have some t-shirts. I saw somebody was wearing one in a random Instagram photo. It did kind of look like she was wearing it because she was like going to go work out or paint a house or something. <laughs> hey, man, that I think is uh, totally reasonable. Yeah, no, I mean. It's okay to go paint a house. Maybe you don't want any paint on your just shoot, but you could get a sweat going in a just shoot t shirt <laughs> for sure. Uh, for sure. But yeah, we appreciate it a lot and we love you guys regardless. Let's talk to George. I guess we wanted to talk a little bit about what we have in common we as a filmmaking podcast no film school as a film a gigantic filmmaking resource that covers everything from screenwriting to filmmaking storytelling gear editing the whole gamut and we we both experience that our listeners might find interesting is we both get pitched topics and guests all the time right like people that have just made a film they want to promote it and they want to go on no film school the podcast or no film school you know the website get an article written because they did something interesting oh, we're, ever, we're just like mr spielberg yeah you're overexposed <laughs> yeah he, he please stop emailing us an exclusive Steve. or nothing steven yeah how many always, times do we have to tell you he's just always asking us to like tweet about his latest movie or something anyway we do hear from people constantly not just steven spielberg about wanting some exposure for the stuff they're doing. And it's a good question. I, you know, um, we have lots of different email accounts that that stuff comes into. Um, We also get lots of uh, thinly veiled threats about some of the content we put out on those email accounts. But that's that's always fun. I love those. But like people are offended by. Oh, yeah, man. Your what you say is a a human being. Yeah, we've had some scary stuff happen, (laughs) but it's it's they're like Tarantino does not compose his shots on you those ju- lenses you, you think it's right. a joke but uh yeah i think a lot of it is facebook honestly the facebook community for no film school is massive what's massive like hundreds yeah of thousands? over half a million getting close to six hundred thousand. and and compared to some other really big sites like IndieWire, it's it's larger and i don't know why i don't know how and when that happened with no film school's facebook page but uh, i think to me it makes sense no film school it's kind of like the elevated BuzzFeed of the film industry. And IndieWire is like about independent films, you know? Right. Like you, you will write about James Cameron in a way that they oh, that's probably so interesting. don't. I frankly am a little disheartened with the amount, the, how unindie it is, right? There's a, lot of, there's a lot of Tarantino coverage. But what really I think oh. No Film School nails is that it's community that, oriented. Yeah, that was the right? goal. No Film yeah. School... I like we're I'm going to get into it in the comments about, you know, 
what I really think Tarantino's lens choices yeah. mean in a way that in IndieWire is just is, is like a variety or a Hollywood Reporter yeah, totally. or something like that where you're just kind of like there for for news of like And we like want it, that, you know? which is why yeah. I always like, you know, I I'm happy to hear from people. Sometimes they just react to headlines, which is frustrating. Like you can tell they didn't read they, like sometimes you put out a headline that's that's bombastic in some way. I don't want to say clickbait because we try to avoid that, mm-hmm. but Hey, it happens. That's the business. Oh, yeah. We're going to have to censor. This episode, <laughs> but yeah, um, it's only clickbait if you don't follow through. Right. In the yes, article. exactly. And also sometimes right. in your article, you end up contradicting and presenting a really strong counterpoint. And anyway, I love the engagement and the discussion and I love the community factor. That's a huge part of what, what we try to do. And that's why I think the Facebook page is active and the group is is large and bringing me back full circle. It's why you get some really aggressive stuff on there just about things that seem not like they are life and death, but it gets, uh, it's, it gets pretty wild. So would you say most of your community is filmmakers as opposed to film That's fans? A really good question. And it's a big distinction. Look, there's obviously a big crossover, right? Like I'm both. Are you guys both? <laughs> like, yeah, I, I, I think I all filmmakers are my <laughs> first movie. I, I set I, you up so well for that. I'm gonna watch one eventually. Eventually, I'm gonna see one. But. No, but I think there are people that are worried about like Star Wars canon that don't totally, have ab- you know, totally. Adobe That's Premier the thing. The Venn, right. Well, right? It's like Avid. instead of the Venn diagram, it's like a circle in a circle, really. And I think that we have done things to the we we've published content that is not really for filmmakers like we've definitely put out content that's like this is for people who are or it's for filmmakers for it's for the film watching side of the filmmakers and it's also for people Mm -hmm. who just want to analyze and love film i mean i love film theory and analysis as much as i love filmmaking so for me it's like that's a big part of why i like doing this and i think you can learn a lot by watching movies and you could be like hey maybe i don't want to make movies but now I do because I'm thinking about the way I watch them differently. But I'm going on, I'm rambling. But yeah, I. Well, you, you know what? It brings up the point that I think is really kind of at the core of what we're talking about. The act of podcasting or running a website about filmmaking and for the love of films is because we love supporting exactly. filmmakers, right? And so when you get pitched, it's very hard. Like we're constantly, our heart goes out to every single person who ever sends us an email and says hey will you talk about my movie because we know exactly how hard it is to have made one in the first place yeah i have a special trash can in my gmail where i put those emails (laughs) it's not just a regular trash does it have a heart on it yeah but so but 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 you're torn because it's like yeah it's a mild lake you want to support people right but also you do want people to listen to the show and there is that balance between going for the big numbers right and, and and getting exposure and, and reaching more people and, and ultimately helping more people, hopefully, and becoming like a, a bigger entity and supporting those smaller filmmakers. I think Oren and I have the luxury of not worrying about numbers in quite the same way because this isn't a real business. It's like a part of our lives, but it's not like we're beholden to anyone besides who we want right. to program right but yeah like, we have uh you know right you we guys have, have overheads, demands you know and needs to meet on a level that puts us in a position where we sometimes have to weigh uh content decisions and that's a big part of what i do at no film school is kind of like content direction content mm-hmm. decisions and it's a bit of a guessing game sometimes but here's the interesting thing some of the most consistently popular content, and not just in terms of how many people clicked on it, but how long people read it, which I consider far more valuable information than just did a lot of people click it. That's great for some things, but the true metric of success in the world I operate in is how long, is engagement, yeah, uh, through a podcast, through a video, through uh, uh, reading a post, and people in our audience love stories from other filmmakers but they love the ones that are i made blank here's the movie i made on x amount of dollars myself here's how i did it this is my story and if people if filmmakers come to us at no film school and say i really want to get visibility on this project the follow-up is really always well do you have a story you can tell for 
our audience about how you did it, why you did it the way you did it, that's educational and informative that they can get into. Because when that happens, that's like this magical, like perfect storm of content for us where the community is interacting with itself and it's self. So yeah, so my quick answer, uh, that wasn't quick, but <laughs> the, the quicker version of that is if people want their content to be visible on No Film School, the best thing they can do is pitch us on a story about how they did it and, and, and why they did it that way. And no Steven Spielberg, I don't want to hear about the dolly shot in Raiders of the Lost Ark ever again. But that's so interesting to me because I was actually kind of fishing for the exact opposite answer, which is what our, or at least my point of view is, I guess I wanted to frame this around the idea that you're a filmmaker, you've made some work, you want to get, you want to promote it, you want to be interviewed on Just Shoot It, you want to have an article on No Film School. Like, what is the thing that you should say to us and what is the thing that you shouldn't say to us? And to me, one of the biggest issues is that people will approach us and they, they'll want to be on the podcast to talk about their film and they will tell us their story, but it's the exact same story we've heard from every single filmmaker. I made this movie for the price of a used car. You know, we sure. shot it in well, six days. I, I think we George is saying the same stole. thing, though. Like, you, you have to have something that's unique and interesting about the, the journey, right? But, like, if you boil it down, making any film is like, I had an idea. I wrote it down. I got a bunch of people to make it with me we yeah, raised the money yeah. and went and shot it i can speak you know, to like both that's kind sides of, it, of that though right? because yeah there is the there is a maybe the the monomyth of the filmmaker the joseph campbell quest of the filmmaker is pretty universal like my personal story is similar to of the films i made it's like i had very little dollars i worked very hard i you know I died a hundred times trying to do this thing. But I think that what always, there's always that spark, which I think you're referencing, Matt, that is, we had one guy who was a futurist. So his whole thesis was using what many considered to be slightly dated technology and how he was going to get it on the cheap and upgrade it certain ways to get a better finished product. Like there's sometimes there's you're a, talking about filmmaking gear or storytelling. Yeah. Filmmaking gear. Um, okay. that, that was his, so he had an angle with his gear and his tech and it mm -hmm. tied into what kind of story he was telling, which, you know, hopefully it always does with that. But we've also had the stories that are a little less robust in terms of an original angle, but it's still something about the filmmaker in their own words, I think. And it's different. Let's also clarify that print is a lot different than the podcast because you can't have every episode of your podcast be a filmmaker telling a very similar story sure. but you can i guess i hadn't thought about you guys have the the advantage i should say of like ha publishing a lot of articles every week yeah right so we we have one slot a yes week. and so and, and we're spending a couple hours recording and then like you know a couple hours weekly on publishing it you know so it's it's we have fewer shots than you guys. Yeah, and I mean, I think there's also like a volume factor like so what? We publish between somewhere between 8 to 12. It was like a target for a while, new stories a day. So it's a lot. <laughs> oh, a day. Yeah, it's it can be a lot of content. And mm -hmm. I mean, we've slowed that a little bit because we're trying to go for quantity over or quality over quantity, I should say. But if we get a great story from a filmmaker about their process, we definitely want to get it in there. I mean, there aren't always eight good stories a day, you know? Well, so then let me ask, what makes a story about process great? Because I, I, Oren and I always joke, like, uh, a, a small budget isn't a setup, it's, it's a not selling point. <laughs> yeah. Right. No, no, no. I think it's, I like it's a great that. selling point if it's like, oh, yo, like, I made an incredible movie Everyone agrees. 16 movie stars are in it. It premiered at Sundance and it cost $12,000. Right, 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 right. Yeah. Despite the budget. Cause but if you lead with I, my movie cost $12,000, then you probably don't have 16 movie stars. It didn't premiere at Sundance, et cetera, et cetera. So all of those other, you know. Yeah, it can uh, be a deterrent, right? It can be a deterrent to taking are, yeah, interest. Right. And actually, even at, even once you're in the Sundances of the world, you're not supposed to talk about how cheap it was because you don't want people sure. to know because you want to sell it for more, but right. also because you want them to think that, that they're watching, you know, something real. Sure. But um, yeah, so question is, what is an attractive angle when we get pitched a story mm -hmm. from a filmmaker? 
saying something like we used this technology or this gear in a way that was creative or different. Um, we, mm-hmm. you know, I'll give a couple examples that I've had in the past of like, we built this crazy set in our garage could be an interesting angle. I shot it all. Just me and my wife was a fun one. <laughs> that was the lead there. Um, I am trying to think of some other, it was a, it was a high concept fantasy epic that I did at something like, you know, then then the budget becomes a little more like, I mean, if, you, if you're telling me you, you remade 12 Angry Men for $1,000, I'm not going to like drool over that. <laughs> but right. If well, right. If well, you lead with $1,000, then you're saying, so my movie's not good. <laughs> right. Or yeah, right. it's like, yes, you, you kind of want to leave that out unless you say, so like if you say to me, I may, I realize my, my like large canvas Lord of the Rings fantasy epic I shot it for a thousand dollars. Then I'm thinking, wow, it's either like tremendously awful, which is fascinating to me in, on some level, like like you know, right? Like a thousand. Sure, you're right. Watch I kind of want to see right? the you yeah. know, or it's like, how in the name of God do you pull that off? And I think either way, it's worth a look, right? So if it if there's like a if the principle of contrast between the resources and the delivered product is enough that it that it grabs me or us. Right. If you made Kung Fury all in your yeah, living room. But here's the other right. thing. And I know this is not what filmmakers want to hear because this doesn't help really. But if you're getting any eyes anywhere, which isn't as hard as it used to be, like not saying I put it up on YouTube, but saying like we have distribution now. It makes it already like a little more like you, you cleared a certain hurdle that then for us, it makes it easier to say, well, if you spent $2,000 on this movie, I like how I just doubled that $1,000 movie budget. Uh, if you spent $2,000 yeah. on this movie and it's now available on Amazon, well, there's something, right? Like, I mean, right. maybe just right. a little something. <laughs> but, but dude, every movie is available. Right, I was going to say, that's why I'm saying like, it's just a little sure, something, sure. It but was, it's something. <laughs> but, but so, you know, the other thing I'm hearing, though, in all of your examples is like, there's something that the reader can maybe replicate at home. Like, oh, I've got a garage. Oh, I've got a thousand dollars. Oh, I've got a fantasy you know, script or something like that. There's a little bit of like, there's a DIY Yeah, Matt, I think you might be better at doing my job to... than I am because you did. A, you just identified oh, it man, really well. well. Yes, that's exactly what it there is. You go. It's something they can do, which I think comes... Like a Yeah, away. and I think that actually is like a core of so much of what we try to do in general. Like, even if we're talking about James Cameron and stuff that's like mainstream Hollywood, we try to find a way to make it applicable even if it's like yeah, a how to shoot avatar in your garage <laughs> or like i would, right, I would I mean, I, that, that would be though. an amazing story i think but like why james cameron is is valuable is a good is a question worth asking beyond like he's great at making movies like there could be insight there could be mind depths to mine there at least i'm always trying to um, but i think you're exactly right it's i mean w- let me ask you guys what is it that gets like, I think about it a lot, like, when I was a full-time filmmaker, before I was a full-time no film school editor, I would have loved to have something I did, like, featured on no film school, or I would have loved to be interviewed by you guys on your podcast about my film. What is it that you guys look for that makes the cut? Well, see, I guess for me, even though Matt is saying that I'm the prescriptive guy and I'm the one that is trying to find the bullet points and the takeaways, which... I totally am. Like, I'm a guy that's, like, addicted to tutorials. Like, I love... To, to be fair, the overlap is pretty great between <laughs> Oren and I. But there are... there are There's a crescent moon on each edge. Right. Right, yeah. But what I wanted to say is, like, when you pitch me a project, I have zero interest in learning how you made something bad. <laughs> you know? Zero? That can be fun. Um, I mean, I'm not saying it's good for no film school, but I do think... For it us... Can... One yeah. slot a week. One <laughs> slot a week, George. get to talk okay. to one filmmaker a week, I want to talk to... I want you to lead with like, this is why my project is awesome. This is why I want you to pitch it to me because you want me to watch your movie, you know? Yeah. I want you to sell me on the product that you made and then how you made it. You know, if it did play at Sundance and you did make it for $2,000, that's interesting because how do you make a Sundance level movie? You know, if you did get the DP from Joker to come, you know, set up this camera rig for you or whatever, that's interesting. And I know it sounds like it's name droppy, but those are easy ways for us to validate your work. Absolutely. But if yeah, you say, I agree. Same for hey, me. I made this movie, the entire 
um, cast was Vietnamese refugees <laughs> and the crew was everyone donated money and my mom made all the food and all that stuff. It's cool. It's novel. But like if what you made is not interesting, like Matt and I will always watch the trailer when somebody pitches us a project. And a lot of times we're like amazing pitch. Great thing. Really interesting story. We watch the trailer. Looks like trash, you know. <laughs> sure, um, or, we have or, no interest I mean, it's, in talking frankly, to you about how you made when, this. That's it's it's really it, it's harder when the movie's pretty good. That's the real issue. Yeah, that's uh, I think that's more common than when it's like, oh, like I would probably watch this on an airplane. Well, but it has that's to be a lot harder. What do you mean by pretty good? It you can't look like. Sometimes the cinematography is great. It looks like a movie you would see in a the theater, but the story is the same as something we've seen. You know, isn't it amazing how common great visuals are now like you can really execute really solid visuals and the tech and the gear is there like i mean it's not like your budget does not eliminate your ability to capture beautiful imagery and that alone used to be i mean i'm old i don't know how old you guys are i i say i'm old i'm i'm older than i've ever been in my life but like <laughs> but sure. like i think we're all, yeah i think we're all in that boat parents. right yeah. <laughs> has everyone had that experience yeah. but yeah. um there was a time where you could immediately look and be like oh this is crap <laughs> or you could immediately sure. listen and say oh this is crap now like everybody's got the ability to put something that looks and sounds pretty good together and you're gonna have to give it a little more time before you can really decide sometimes you, you still know fast. But. No, what you're saying is great cinematography is not going to make us interested in your movie. Yeah. Right? Because a lot yeah. of people are really good at cinematography. That said, really bad cinematography has a high chance of turning us off of your yeah, movie. without a doubt. But if, but if somebody sent me a trailer and the very first shot is a kid and it's shot on an iPhone 6 S and it doesn't look that film. good, but the sound is good and the kid is crying and they're all alone in a part, you know, in... A battle zone like uh, i'm in you know yeah like what's yeah. happens next no tech um, the there's something to to be said for um using different methods and things that don't look quote unquote good and just having a story that grabs you and being compelled to pay attention that's absolutely yeah. the truth yeah. and like but if it's shot on an alexa with anamorphic lenses and there's 18ks at the windows and it's a young pretty <laughs> A woman who the alarm is ringing and she hits it to stop. It's six a.m. again. Got to get to work. I'm out. We've never we've never been pitched that movie. But I think that we're talking about. There's two different. Where did you see my movie? (laughs) Well, your movie ruined it for the for the rest of the movie. That (laughs) macro shot of the uh, of the alarm. Yeah, really, really. Five fifty nine flipping over to six. So hand slams Uh, down. (laughs) <laughs> yeah. Um, so there's two things. We're talking about X Factor, which is really hard. Like, it's really hard to look at your movie and say, like, oh, is it zeitgeisty or, like, of the moment? And it's lightning in the bottle. Yeah, or do bottle, you get right? tone? Like, we've had short filmmakers on, like Zane Rubin and other people that they haven't even made a feature. But we're like, you look at her shorts and you're like, she's, there's something special there, you know? Yeah. yeah. She's yeah, telling yeah. stories. They feel kind of familiar, but they're also, like, totally different, you know? You know who I, I think an example of what, of what we're talking about to me recently is a movie I love from last year, Uncut Gems, because oh, sure. well, yeah. there's so many people yeah. who didn't like it because it's so not in line, like from the fact that it's film grain to the use of Sandler to the weird, the way the story is told. There's so many things about it that are just a little against the grain. And yet, dude, everyone loves that movie. When are you talking? Oh, about? I know a lot. A good dude, movie. I know a lot of people Bro, who don't sit like down it. and watch that movie with your mom. Yeah, no, a lot, I, everybody, everybody in our. <laughs> I think everybody in our community loves that movie. Yeah, but that's yeah. who we're talking to. But well, yeah, yeah, fair enough. Yeah, that's a good point. But I think my example is more like that movie does things a little differently, and it doesn't always feel neat. And I think one of the problems is when you get something that feels neat but does things the same. You just kind of turn away. Like we want to see somebody do something a little weird and a little like attention that grabs your attention and grabs your, that compels you and that. But I think what's interesting between our different perspectives on this isn't just the platforms and the amount of slots we have available, but that our interest, my interest at No Film School is so process focused. Results, like the quality of your finished work actually to me personally isn't as important 
as your your process. And I say that even about like when we talk to a filmmaker, like I'll interview podcast interviews with filmmakers for pretty mainstream like, you know, releases. Like studio films. Yeah, studio films and or 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 streaming studio streaming content. And I don't care if it's not good, if it's not good in my opinion. Like I want to talk to them about how they got their job, how they do their job, what they love about their work, how their career like process for us is everything. And so that's kind of where the, like, I joke, like, you're sure you don't want to, like, watch a really awful thing for a while? But I do kind of have this, I, I think I have to maintain this perspective with for No Film School of, well, it may not be good, but that's not why we're here. We're here to talk about how we do this, how we approach it as a life, you know, and a career. Yeah. Well, you, the, the career thing, I think, is really interesting, though, because that, I, that's the other half of our criteria, like it's rare for us to talk to a first time filmmaker because making your first film is very, very hard, but making your second film, like making a living off of filmmaking is the kind of the secret goal of this yeah. show, right? It's not just shoot it. It's making a living. I mean, off it's of not even a secret. <laughs> like part of our mission yeah. is an insight into the working director. What did you do in your life that made f being a director or a filmmaker a career that literally pays your bills? Right. And so, George, I think your point of like, oh, the process, I think, is is the same for us. But we are more likely to talk to, say, a working TV director that you haven't. Or even a commercial you, director. Or a commercial director where you don't recognize yeah. their name, but maybe you recognize their work. Well, that's a person. I would, too. <laughs> I mean, for, I would totally do, like I would love that. Those. Yeah. We're usually jumping on them to. Uh, yeah. Send them. them so and, there's less competition. And, and, for change, and then steal their identity. <laughs> Don Draper style. They're all in my basement. Um, yeah. No. Uh, send those people along to me, too. <laughs> no, but I, I, uh, I agree. Like, that's the. Um, to use the phrase that's the separates the men from the boys almost like literally age wise right because like you can make your sure. you can be born into this industry and then what happens like make it, it's there's like a whole thing of like I think Sundance has a whole program of called second film that I've Ryan Koo and I have talked about and he's but right it, but but the, there's a lot of challenge like so the industry at large this is a fascinating subsection of what we talk about within the no film school uh mind hive mind of like the industry doesn't really help promote like it you can break in by getting that first thing out there sometimes you can break through the noise sometimes but it's really hard to be developed it's really hard to find like ex more work working consistently making a living like you said like these are the things that really uh, like you say, that's the goal of the podcast. I feel like that's kind of the secret sauce to no film school too, in a way is like, what other things can you do in this industry to make money? Can you like be an owner operator? Can you rent out some gear? Can you, you know, what, all that stuff, but it's a fascinating angle. And yeah, I mean, when you're taught, you want to have a person on who has made something that everyone thinks is quality enough that they're willing to listen to their advice. Right. We'd have to put it at least mm -hmm. that sure. that bar. Right. There are Sundance movies that I'm not a big fan of, but I can tell that the person that made them has something that gets them. Yeah, high, that's a know? great point. Or because I so we go to Sundance, we cover Sundance for no film school, South by Southwest. I've seen a lot of things that I personally loved. And I've also seen a lot of things that I personally did not love. And I've spoken to the filmmakers for all of them. And I always approach it like, well, you got your movie. You made your movie. You're here at Sundance. Like, you have something to teach me. You have something to teach somebody. Like, whether or not what I think of what it is, is, is secondary there. And I respect you building this career and where you and just tell me what that's like. What is it like to even be at Sundance? You know, I mean, this is a whole that that's not applicable to the original point, which is like coming on to promote a, a project. But I think that every creative is in this boat with us, like pushing forward upstream uh, in this in a challenge. It's a challenge. And so I'm always curious about like, well, why did, why did you do that? It, I'm pro I probably wouldn't have done it. <laughs> like I wouldn't have made that movie, but I'm still kind of curious. And I'm sure always there's somebody out there who is also curious because maybe they loved it, you know? Well, what are some common approaches that people take to try to get featured by no film school 
that are bad? <laughs> like, what are the things that will instantly make you feel like I've seen this before? And like, can you? Are there any kind of tropes? Yeah, I think in general, when avoid? I see emails that lead with "why this is good for me," I kind of my mind sort of like there's like why this is a good fit for no. Well, console? why more less good fit more you need to do this is imperative because like this you you should really like when there's this sense of urgency of like it's going to help you out a lot because i always feel like that's a strange kind of con that i just like like it feels like too sweaty yeah, or too it's pushy I think or, it's, or 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 out of touch even right like you know you've got a cool, like six hundred thousand right Facebook it's like, or followers. like and however millions of page views a month i don't like i i can't be threatened into thinking that like the Safty brothers aren't going to threaten me into covering, right? you know what I mean? So you sure. can't, th- they're, they're, <laughs> yeah, they're yeah. like, they're, they might not even return our, their PR people won't return our calls perhaps. So like it, you're not going right. to, that's not a trick that could work, but it's annoying to see that trick because it's like, come on. Like, would you think you're going to convince me that this is, if an, you miss this opportunity, right? you'll regret it that's, for the rest yeah, of your life. You do get those like, listen, I know you get a lot of these, but this is why you've got to pay attention to this one. It's the it's so important and you'll regret it because or like there there's a sales quality that I think we are all trained to some degree to turn the brain off a little bit. So whenever I see something that feels like the hard sell and it's I think so hard to I boy I feel for him, right? Because like it's so hard to sell your movie, right? You're yeah. putting yourself out on a limb to like email us. Like that again, it goes back to that thing of like we got into this because we love movies and we want to promote people. But like there is just, it just takes a tiny step too far. And then all of a sudden you're a turnoff. Do you guys have a thing you see that uh, without knowing a single thing about the movie, without watching the trailer, is there, are there like keywords? Like if you were a computer, I think about SEO and Google a lot. So forgive yeah, yeah. me. But like, I think like if, is, are there keywords that unlock your attention? Because there are for me, and I'm curious. You could if- probably you could probably write an algorithm that would be a solid filter for whether or not we were gonna be interested in an interview for sure. What's it- I, I guess I, I'm. What's boy, it like? It's pretty nuanced. We though. talked about this yeah. earlier today. There is one thing that will get me. <laughs> it's pretty a, much. It's a double edged sword, though. Go for it. I don't. It's a. Is big it a child shot thing. on an iPhone six <laughs> in a war torn? <laughs> See, I remember. <laughs> it's if they are genuine fans uh, of our podcast then i will pretty much like look at anything and people i mean yes people send us trailers and short films but people will send us feature scripts sometimes they'll be like <laughs> read this let's talk about it and if they're like i've been listening to you for four years i loved this episode this episode when you said this it just made me decide to do this i made my movie and i learned everything like every day on my way to set i listen to just shoot it to get tips i feel like we are now they know me and I want to know them, you know? We have definitely been duped a couple times. Like, hey, huge fans of the podcast. And then people come on the podcast and they have no idea what an unpaid endorsement is, which we do at the end of every single early, episode. Early or, in, or in logs onto email after podcast sees 100. <laughs> Love the podcast, subject yeah, lines. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. We, we, there was a early on we didn't, like we didn't realize we were on a few lists. And so we started getting pitched more and someone was like, oh, I love your podcast. <laughs> and it worked out great. But like, yeah, now, now you, it was now pretty evident back that he bit. had never listened to our podcast <laughs> once he was on the podcast. It's like, hey, which one's Matt? Which one's Oren? What do you guys, what do you guys do? But again, like kind of coming to us, it's kind of the opposite of what you're saying, right? You're saying if someone comes and says like, George, you are an idiot if you don't program my grandma's like wedding video that is just, I mean, a Polish person has never married an Armenian person before. You must see this. Then you're like turned off. Like, what are you doing? But if someone came to us and said like, hey, I'm a huge fan of the podcast. I've listened, you know, my, I actually recorded my grandma's wedding and it, this story came and unfolded out of it. And like what I learned from you guys, you know, I don't know. It, it's, it's a totally different you, approach. You, so with, to me, with the big caveat though, Oren, like, I think that that all all of that does work on us uh, from an egotistical level and i think that's probably true for every other press outlet yeah but also when you're approaching actors i think yeah i think so but also cast. you still can't break any of the other rules we've already talked about right like if you're like hey i love the podcast so much my movie costs one thousand dollars isn't and isn't very good <laughs> you, you, you still don't get right. to be honestly if know. someone emailed me and said i love no film school but i shot this cheap t- 
terrible movie. Would, can you feature it? I would say like, I, I'm actually like, you have my curiosity and now you have my attention. But, but uh, I, sometimes we get ones that are just so bizarre that I, that I screenshot them or I share them. Cause like, I can't even tell, like, it's like, it's almost, it's just so bizarre. Like the whole like storyline like, and narrative that I'm getting is like confusing and fascinating. But um, there's definitely like the same thing of, and I'm not, you know, no film school is, is far bigger than me. So I think for you guys, when you hear like, I love just shoot it, it's like a direct thing. But even so, right. when I hear somebody say, they're like, I love Matt and not <laughs> right. Yeah. That's, that's always a winner. I'm like, yeah, it's perfect. When I hear things like people say, I've always read no film school. I've learned so much from no film school. I love it. Like that makes me feel good. Even as a person who's been editor in chief there for only a couple of years, because it just means that they are they're loyal to the brand. They care about what we try to do and it does get my attention for sure. And it and I think that's just a, generally a smart tactic as long as it's it's true, you know, to I usually to, just email and say, "I love yeah. insert name of your <laughs> yeah. website." Yeah. But do you yeah, do wouldn't it be it. funny if this tactic like made its way into, into Hollywood and people were like, "I love CAA. I love everything about CAA. I would love <laughs> yeah, to yeah. be like featured <laughs> prominently." I mean, everybody well, does uh, do yeah. that actually, but I, you know, I it, this reminds me of a of a story. I don't think I've told on the show that I think will listeners will get a kick out of and maybe find some consolation in because I think I want to make it clear that we all know how hard it is to pitch anybody on anything and how hard you worked on your film, right? So like all of that Years ago, I had a a web series called Mountain Man that was like uh, about like a crazy guy who lives up in the woods and has like a giant beard and like it was kind of like this magical realism sort of thing. And so we were up for a few awards. And so I sent everyone in the voting body like an ATF slash like a government dossier, basically, that was a profile of Mountain Man. I thought it would be really fun. And it's got like you know like it's all paper clipped together and hand stamped and it looked really like fun and i really had a lot of a good time with all the art direction on it but i i sent a tuft of his beard hair it's long (laughs) i just went to like hollywood toys and costume and bought like a tuft of hair and like put a few strands i wish you had specified where you got that fake hair yeah listen it's like 99 cents at hollywood toys and costume sure sure great um but it was gross and we put it in a little (laughs) ziploc bag and like you know wrote like specimen beard hair like with like a little tag on it and i thought oh man this is so creative and so fun and multiple high-powered people i sent it to like a few agencies and stuff i saw tweets of like don't send disgusting hair to me ever again not directed to you just like in public just like on twitter like You know, public service announcement, don't send hair in the mail. It's gross, (laughs) said famous agent. (laughs) That's a good one. So I've been there, guys. I've been there. That's a good one. (laughs) Back when I was doing like all these Quiznos, like branded videos and we're trying to get them to go viral, I would always email the Hollywood Reporter or, you know, Jezebel or whoever. And I would try to always like feed the headline of their article. Which is good advice, frankly. In my subject line. And I would say like, hey, I would try to find, let's say we did a parody of Game of Thrones and I wanted someone, you know, on BuzzFeed or whatever, Vox to cover it. I would find the writer that covers Game of Thrones. I'd say, hey, I know you love, you you know, I loved your article on Game of Thrones about this and this. Like we made this thing because we're huge fans. You know, I thought you might get a kick out of it. But we would try to kind of like feed in the headline into the the document that's amazing is, you know, advice it, for anybody who it, wants to get something on no film school like i i wish i had thought of that maybe you should both do my job instead of me um <laughs> hopefully ryan's not listening but the, <laughs> but i was gonna say that's amazing advice because if somebody if you i always have to say to people even when i like the story that they're sending like can you give me some headline ideas like because that's that's like maybe the most important thing about it like yeah like yeah it's like and if you can't give me that then i have to figure it out and i have to figure it out for a bunch of other things every day and i can't even do that always the best the at the optimum level so if you come right out the gate at us with even like i love no film school is fine but you could even if you're just got a great killer headline for why this is a story and actually come to think of it some of the ones i've referenced had it like me and my wife shot this movie, just the two of us. It was immediately like, boom, I know that's going to work. And it did, you know, because like that, that like, I'm curious, whatever the movie is, 
Um, I'm curious if you're still married. And to then be they're honest. also but nice like, in the email. Yeah, <laughs> right. And they're right. nice in the email. But but the idea of giving us the headline, like pre-writing the headline, the pitch being like, what do, what do people say? Like you guys do a lot of pitching. I've done a lot of pitching in general. Everybody hearing a pitch wants to hear a pitch they'd like to buy. They want to hear something yeah, sure. that they want to say yes to. It feels like they want to say no, but it's more like they have to say no. They, they can't say yes unless it's so good they have to say no. You, you know what I mean? But we want a pitch to come through email that's like, this is going to be a great thing on No Film School, or this can be a great guest on the podcast. I mean, if you've got eight to 12 articles you have to publish a day, like make it easy on you, right? Like, oh, I got an email this morning. This The, the take is already baked into the email. These people seem nice and sane and like my embed code is right there all of the stuff i need is is right there at my fingertips yeah check one article done right and if next. and if they write it what's sometime... tarantino up to next <laughs> hey tarantino just uh wrote another blog <laughs> post on new beverly let's talk about that for a while <laughs> the thing i like is you know we always end up having to go down this road you guys probably don't need to do this on the podcast but we do this like okay we like it can you put it in a google doc for us okay do, oh, do you have some images Okay. Yeah, do yeah. you have uh, like and and then, and then it becomes okay? Well, hold on. Let, let let let's break that down though, because I think if people can get ahead of that, and when they're sending it to you, like here's the Google Doc, here's the the, the link to all the press. Well, images. what do you think about press? Yeah. Kits? What do you what do you want to see in a press kit? Is what I'm asking. You know, mostly we only get a press kit from a studio and a real PR firm. It's so rare that you get a press kit from somebody who's just trying to get their personal movie. Like we get the press kits from, we have relationships with PR people at all the, a lot of the big firms and outlets. So like, uh, you know, name your movie will, will likely, I mean, maybe not tenant, but like, but a lot of movies will send us the press kit, but we don't get them from just, uh, Joe or Jane filmmaker who's saying I should, we get their message about wanting us to cover the film, but we don't always get a, we rarely get a press kit from them. And so the so answer what? would be, so I would I'm love to get a press kit because it would help yeah, us yeah. immediately decide, oh, here's what this movie is. Here's what the story is. And if you can pre-write something and attach it, then we can decide very quickly and we don't have to do it. Well, let's get into nitty gritty though. Are we talking, you want a, a link to a Google Doc? You want a, a, like high res photos in like a Google Drive? Tell us like, paint us the picture of like literally. If I was pit doing a press kit, I would do like a PDF that has some awesome images and then like a Dropbox link in addition. With yeah, but that would, but George, but there's ahead. a reason you said Google Doc. You want to be able to cut and paste and edit a lot faster. A PDF, I guess you can cut yeah. and paste on. Well, unless you're over the age of 50, right? <laughs> sure. <laughs> but, but like oh, but I, a PDF... <laughs> A PDF, you can scroll through everything yes. at once. As a, like, I don't know. I think of a Google Doc as like Fair a Word enough. Doc, which is just like a nightmare. Yes, to I think through. that the Google Doc is valuable because we can just quickly pull it, strip it of its formatting, get it right up into our CMS. Um, that's some like uh, inside baseball talk about making things happen on a website. But you're, and, like, you're, you're, you're blogs. Yeah, system. yeah, our blog yeah, system. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we can get it up on, on the back end of the website. And we can your content management right, content system. Content management system, yes. And we can get uh, the images in there, and the images should be less than one megabyte, and they should be high res, and they should be beautifully framed, and they should be stills from your movie. There should be BTS images. That's always great. That's just as good. There should be a trailer, a link to a trailer on YouTube or Vimeo. And if you have a story about making your film that you want us to cover, you should write it. And you should pitch it to us with the written thing and with the headline. And that is like turnkey, you know, like that, that's yeah. almost, you're making it almost hard for us. I'm not saying we won't say no, because, you know, we have to have, we have standards, we have other considerations, but you're making it a lot easier to say yes, because. But should they write like one or two paragraphs of a story or like one or two pages of a story? Well, I always think with length. It's not a good answer, but the best, but the only real answer is it depends on the length of the story that they need to tell. So, like, if you write me a thousand words about something that could have been in 500, then that's bad. But if you write me 250 words and it's real short, but it's good. I mean, to be honest, it would be hard for me to see a 250 word story about someone making their own film that would be worth it. That's more like us covering what Tarantino said yesterday for, for something of length, like a deep 
this is how I made my film or why I made my film this way, I think we'd want to see like over 500 words. And right. that's a few paragraphs at least. And that's got to have some. And this is in the first email they send you, right? This is a dream scenario. This <laughs> sure. never happens. Yeah, but, but like <laughs> but it would, somebody's yeah, got but, their film, you know, they're driving in their car and they're like, oh man, it's time for me to release my movie. I'm going to send it to George. And you're telling them yeah, exactly they, what you want, you know? Yes. If I was telling the guy or girl who's made their film and is trying to put it out there somewhere or is getting it released and they like no film school and they want no film school to cover it, I would say, like what I've said, it needs to have some kind of angle that's educational about your process that's unique. And if you have a 500 plus word story you've written about that with a good headline that, that captures this, this angle... Um, and some good high res images. If you send that to us at editor at nofilmschool.com, there's a real good chance like that we would want to publish it because you're taking a lot of the difficult part out of the process where we kind of have to, you know, I'm motioning, pulling something slowly because like, because like sometimes you hear something and you're like, well, there might be something in there, but then we have to kind of navigate those waters. And that's frankly time that we could better spend on, on a quicker you know, delivery. I mean, I'm, I'm curious. These are great questions and I'm glad you're you asking. You heard it here, folks. You want to reach hundreds <laughs> yeah. of thousands of no film school fans? Yeah, yeah but I... Yeah. But How's I that it. for prescriptive, Oren? <laughs> <laughs> See, that whole thing of being prescriptive is something we try to do also. The how-tos, like, so much of it... If it Get prescriptive in what you write about making your film. Like, if you can write us a story that's like, here's how I did X... And you can really break it down in a way that's actionable for somebody so they can look at it and say, I can do that, or I could try that, and here's how, and isn't just theoretical or esoteric. I mean, we love that stuff, like, but we being just like film people, but it's not super useful. What is the use? Like, let me ask it back to you guys, because I think that, is there a version of this that comes to you that's like ready-made and turnkey? Because you're talking about a podcast, so. I mean... No, no, <laughs> like, like there's not, like, like you can't get, it would be weird to get a press release. I guess the best example for us is like, oh, here's a unique filmmaker and a voice we haven't heard before who f- matches our profile exactly. That's kind of as good as it gets. What's the prof? Can you break down the profile? I'm sure the listeners know. So I, <laughs> but yeah, I'm I asking mean, maybe, maybe not though. Like, I, I don't I, think they do. I, I don't I, think we know. I think, <laughs> I, I think you could say second time filmmaker or, or more right or with a real breakout movie that is in in like mid career trajectory right like we always talk about like the working class filmmaker like i want somebody who is working regularly and we're gonna know how famous they are in a year or two but right now we've got them and they're about to get there like like i love when we're talking to people who are in the middle of a transition you know and their voice is unique and they're underrepresented if they're different than every other person that we've had on the show that's really helpful and yeah you um, touched on something there that that connects for us uh for me which is underrepresented or diverse because it's not just like you're checking off a box i try to always make it clear it's not just like we want to have diversity for diversity's sake it's that it's a different it's a whole different perspective. It's a whole different background and way of telling stories and way of of solving problems and approach to the world or vision. like and so that's why you know everyone around the business isn't just trying to fill a quota. They're trying to break some ground in terms of what we're all seeing in the content. And so like yeah, if there's a perspective or a uniqueness of any kind, you should definitely lead with that you know yeah and and that all that is to say like they still need to be <laughs> impressive filmmakers you know yeah yeah i, that, I like that, that, you, I like that, that was a good that's stop the first that thing drum. <laughs> it's like, that's the first thing every time you say that i imagine the worst version of the thing that's like the not competent like decent version of the one <laughs> and it makes me laugh because i'm like oh yeah. yeah there's the there's a really bad version of that that nobody wants to put on their podcast or website <laughs> Yeah. Well, for me, the number one thing that I look for in a guest is someone that I am curious about how they did something, you know, like that I want to ask them questions like, how did you get this job? You just 
We just had a director on that has been directing a bunch of... He was an editor on Crazy Ex-Girlfriend, and now he's just directing like 17 episodes of TV a year. And we are trying... You know, how did you go from being the person everyone just saw as the editor, you know, who are in reality more in demand than directors. You know, good TV editors are harder to find than than decent TV directors. How did you make that jump? How did you prove to people, like, how did you convince them to stop looking at you as an editor and start taking you seriously as a person that can work with actors, a person that can frame shots, that can, you know, get a crew to come in on time? Because none of those things have to do with editing. Um, do you ever so to find... me, that's like an interesting yeah, I agree. thing that I want to know. I agree. It leads me to a question I, I want to ask because... It's, it could help me in, in what I in what I'm doing for no film school but I'm always curious about the how did you get it I've been my whole life like about filmmakers or anybody who does anything you would like to do someone sitting in the director's chair and being paid to be there I think a lot of us in the world are like how did you get there you know sure and yeah. I think and, that and especially when it's recent yeah right like that's the different that's the problem with talking about Spielberg or Tarantino or yeah. whatever. Yes, no, like, because... It, just doesn't, it basically right. doesn't count anymore. Right. right, which was kind of getting to get to my, my question, which was like, sometimes it's so long ago that it's less... that there's a chance it's less applicable. I will say sometimes it really is, though. Sometimes it's really interesting regardless of when, of how long ago. But mostly it's it's hard to apply to today if it's like how Spielberg started. But sometimes it's... But you can't see attitude sometimes. Like we just, we interviewed a few months ago, Elaine Goldsmith Thomas, who's with Julia Roberts' agent and uh, Halle Berry's agent. She produced Hustlers and she's been in the business for a very long time. But you could tell from talking to her that she has the personality of like... She won't take no for an answer. Yeah. You know? Whenever you and, talk to one of those people, you're like, oh, yeah, that's why I can't. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Like, I'm not, I, yeah. I'm, I don't have that metal. I mean, deep literally, we went to her. Yeah. But we don't ever do that. Yeah. You know, well, that's like, a great get. Just, that's a brilliant, that's a great idea is to talk to somebody like that and not like, so going back to kind of where I was going with my question, it's like sometimes the story, even if it is recent, is so unique. It's like, I'm not, this isn't a real example, but it's like, well, that one day the director got a stomach flu and he left the room and they were like, hey, you, do you want to direct this? And the rest is history, you know? And then, and whenever I get those, I'm always like, yeah, so often it feels like there isn't a repeatable set of prescribed actions that you can sure. take it, and that's it the is hard something part where you're you're looking for it to be teachable yeah there, hard, <laughs> you, you can't be like well just make a good movie <laughs> yeah well, but matt calls that strategy that you just described the being in the building strategy yeah right? well no that's that's great yeah and i i think that like so the way i like the <laughs> we were talking about it earlier but i interviewed uh jonathan frakes on the no film school podcast who was mm -hmm. a famous actor on a famous TV series who asked if he could direct some episodes. Now he's more of known as a working director. He is like sure. a working director all the time. Um, he also broke, he was like doing a lot of like kids. I feel, yeah, I feel like as a teenager, he did like clock stoppers. Yes, I want to say some, he's, I was like Riker directed <laughs> clock stoppers. Yeah. Yeah. He, he, Fred Savage did that too. Yeah. Like, yeah. Yes. Boy, Fred Savage, so. his career is insane. And so yeah. like what's on the one hand, it's like, how did you get started? It's like, well, I was, was uh, <clears throat> on the TV show, duh. Yeah. But it's like, but on the other hand, it's like, but you did something that any of us could do. You went up and you said, hey, I want to do this. Like, what do I have to do to get a shot at this? And you may have been born on third in this in instance, so to speak, but you didn't just stand, like you saw what you wanted, you figured out how to get there. Like there's lessons somewhere in there that, that maybe is teachable. So like, I'm always trying to look for that. And I guess I'm curious for you guys is like, you find some the being in the building is a good one. Like, just just how do you find the teachable moment in the thing that is so often like right place, right time? You know. Right. Well, the other type of story I really like, which is kind of related to this, is I love huge failure followed by huge success because in that while that is like less teachable, it's like more an empathetic type of interview. Like we had. Like Lily Marie, you're talking about actors. She was on 86 episodes of ER and they wouldn't let her direct an episode. You know, <laughs> right. um, we had Maggie Kiley on. She directed three features and then every single studio's directing program. And she could not get one episode of TV. Yeah. And now, like, literally, I would probably, like I, I would like, definitely give my pinky for either of their careers yeah. <laughs> in, in a genuine, literal sense. Yeah. Like, go get the machete. No, I, grade. but, but that's, I, I, I love stories about failure. Like, and full stop, 
because I think failure is like a much better teacher than success. And it's like you said, empathetic, human, and it's more about perseverance, right? And we've <laughs> all like a story about success, like a story that just does this, and I'm doing the line that goes up, like <laughs> like isn't a story. So like we need to see. Like we need to relate to somebody who struggled with a failure, or overcome it. But we also that's like that's the stuff that makes life, you know, life. And I, I like anybody who can talk about like the what didn't works has more to tell us, you know. Yeah, I want to find this email I got recently because I think it's kind of like a perfect ending to this conversation of somebody that was pitching us to have them on the podcast to talk about their movie. And I turn them down. Oh, here we go. I'm looking for eyeballs and fans for our short film. It talks a little bit about the film. He says, we'd love to be a guest for an interview if interested. As first time writer directors that pulled off a 30 minute film for $2,000, we're more than happy with, to talk to you regarding the journeys, the ups and downs and everything we learned along the way. And then he sent the trailer, which actually was not, was pretty cool, like well shot. Um, he sent me the full 30 minute short and he says, please, you know, check out our trailer. And so I write back to him, hey, congrats on the movie. It looks crazy, like in a good way, which is great. Unfortunately, we're not featuring projects of this level right now on the podcast, but feel free to keep us updated with any of your work in the future. He writes back, thanks for the reply. Just to clarify, are you specifying that you're not interested in covering micro-budget films? Because we're looking for spiritual warriors that support the independent cinema spirit. Perhaps I was barking up the wrong tree. And so then we kind of had a pretty in-depth back and forth about the yeah. type of I, that's so interesting because it really it genuinely hits home for me like <laughs> are you a spiritual like, well, I, but you don't even I, respond I, to any of these emails I, I, right funny. right but but uh, specifically it, i wasn't even on this thread i think they reached out to you specifically well right? i responded and then but it just went back george yes i am a spiritual warrior <laughs> that's the thing that's hard and so it kind of brings it full circle of like i all i want to do is help these people but also like it's not helpful if no one's listening. And I felt like we've had people, we've been doing this for five years. We've had a lot of people that have made these shorts, especially our first couple of years of the podcast. Um, you know, but it, this is what I wrote back to him. You know, to be honest, the micro budget 30 minute film isn't really the territory our podcast covers. It would be if it was the first film you made and you've since made another film that won Sundance or you got an opportunity to direct an episode of Westworld or you sold your documentary to Netflix. And then I said, I told him a little bit more about our podcast. At that point, it was clear to me that he hadn't listened to the podcast, <laughs> right? And I told, you know, like to us, your story is a perfect story for film one. Once you make film two, like come back to us, you know? And that's the kind of stories of perseverance that I think are interesting to me. It's like the person that made this like excellent movie and nobody wanted to talk to them. And so then they made another movie and nobody wanted to talk to them. So then they made a third movie. You know who's someone like that? Like Quentin Tarantino. He like spent years making his first movie it wasn't even good enough for him to finish, you know? And then he went and made the second movie. And that's like, to me, the interesting thing that other filmmakers can say, like, oh, you know, I worked really hard and I put ev all my money and all my sweat and tears into this project and it didn't come out the way I wanted it. Like, I'm not going to give up. I'm going to do the next thing. And so that those types of stories are interesting to me. And as long as we're getting them not after the first try, but after the second or third or fourth or fifth try. Yeah, no, I've made a number of those ones. The, the bad ones. <laughs> Everybody has those, and you don't want those to be the ones people find. Let's put it that way. <laughs> but I would I would just I would just add um, to that that no film school could be the place for that first film. Like it could be. It depends. Like, and I think that's a, that's the distinction. I would also say we'd love to get those you know, second, third, like people writing about those, but the, the first, right. and we're not against first. Film, right. No, I, I hear this blue yeah. ruin. We'd be okay. Yeah. <laughs> talking. To I you. think also that's his second film, bro. Oh, is it? Yeah, no, exactly. I think first him as a no, no. And I think I maybe even read this on no film school. <laughs> he, he had a bad like horror comedy. He rebranded really? and like blue. Yeah. Blue room. A, a working DP. At that. Blue ruin. I, Bet my life on it. It's a second film. Well, we can. He, bar he buried the first pinkies. one. Um, yeah. Yeah. I. I, uh, <laughs> yeah. I think it's good though to be clear about the brand and the goals. You know, if you cast too wide a net, then you end up like it's like you have a thin front line. You know, right? Like, multiple also, metaphors mixed together, but like you want to have, uh, you want to be effective at the thing you do, and you want to be able to deliver on that. 
And if your goal is we want to deliver on this, how do you build the career from like step three through eight, you know, or step three through 10 or whatever. And we're trying with no film school. We're just kind of like we're more in a what can we learn about the process at any point in the process? And we try to get closer to the idea of just like was is there an educational nugget in there somewhere you know and i think we cast a wider net but it's but it's definitely challenging and i respect this idea of saying we narrow the focus um it's hard for the people reaching out because it's hard to get to the point where you're making multiples right sure. but uh yeah. it definitely it's it's definitely a good thing for the audience because that's the stuff of building a career right which is which is why i think we do it i I think there's two good good pieces of news for people who are listening right now one if you listened for this long (laughs) you've, you've probably gotten some some solid nuggets in terms of like how to pitch not just our entities but many many other entities as well and also there's not that many press outlets of this type Right, like if you, yeah, they cover independent yeah. film. Yeah, well, truly you know independent. Mean? Like you know, the w- other thing is like we'll write about some of the things IndieWire will or Variety will, but they will never write about someone's first film. <laughs> like they will never right. put that up there. Right. So we like to be by filmmakers for filmmakers at any level, and that's kind of like part of the mission statement. But um, I think there's one thing I want to highlight though for anybody who is still listening. <laughs> In what you mentioned about his pitch, he led with something about we want to get eyeballs. And I think like that's understood. I think when you reach out, I don't think you should say that in general. It's kind of like saying, I mean, it's not as crass, obviously, but it would be kind of like saying if you walked into a pitch at like, you know, legendary or something, and you're like, I want to get rich. <laughs> like, <laughs> like they might respect you if you said that. I don't know. But like, you was just like, I want to sign a big deal with you after this pitch and then talk about what story you're telling. Like, I just think it's not the, the best way to ease in because we want to know more specifically to this. We, we know you want eyeballs. Like we want them too, actually. Like, <laughs> yeah, we want them yeah. for you. Same. Like, yeah. yeah, yeah. If you if you told us how you're going to bring, right? Us yes, involved, you're right. If you say, by the way, I have a million followers on Instagram or whatever, and I'd love to be yeah. on the podcast, there's a good right. chance we'd say, okay. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Though yeah. that's the thing is like, don't don't tell me that. Yeah, t- prove to me it's good for me too. Don't just tell me it's good for me too. And like, yeah. And I do think back to just doubling down on what you said earlier because I I've been thinking about it a lot about like pitching a story and your story of how you made it. I was just thinking of that movie Bellflower. Do you guys remember that tiny indie film that's probably made for like 30 grand? No. But it's these guys that basically were really into building their own flamethrowers and monster cars and things like that. And they made a movie. I think it won South by Southwest. But they made a movie about these guys that build flamethrowers and monster (laughs) cars. You know, and like I, I could see a pitch like that, even though it's a low budget movie, even though there's no one famous in it just kind of coming out of the gate of like, look at this insane movie we made because there's we light things on fire and cars explode and we built all this custom stuff. I'd be like, yeah, let me, I'm, I'm interested in this. And that movie that that guy actually pitched me was, it was shot in the LA River, it had all sorts of weird cinematography, like kind of in, in an interesting way. It had an aesthetic that I feel like if he would have presented it in that way, I don't know, still that we would have like a 30 minute short film right first film on our podcast but it would have instantly gotten me like interested in think like it's kind of like about homeless people in an interesting way but it's like an action movie and you know it's like with the stuff that got you excited about making your project like tell me that i think in, in the beginning as opposed to like the camera that you manage it's just good pitching advice period right it's like what's the passion behind yeah. this as opposed to like what's the yeah. end goal in a sort of monetary or like career focus like what why do we care why sure. does it why did you care yeah you know? pick what's more interesting about your film why you made it or how you made it and then lead with that strongly right. so can we pitch now to each other like films to get on each other's platforms like now that we've learned sure. what in, i'm joking but like so now we're ready to george <laughs> now after this i'm gonna <laughs> yeah. send you an email about a film i want you to feature and you're gonna send me yeah, one yeah there you go well i was gonna pitch good no news film school, i only actually. spent 500 bucks so that's great. <laughs> i'm in oh, nice man i was gonna pitch you no film school by just reading the top five headlines on the website Uh-oh. right now as we record 10 percent of our listeners who d- don't regularly go to film school <laughs> This is why you should, because this is kind of the gamut that you cover. So these are the five headlines. 
Number one, how I recreated 40 plus music videos on a zero dollar budget. Number two, Tarantino, Paul Thomas Anderson, and other filmmakers greats tell you how to write better. <laughs> Number three, releasing Tenet is now a $200 million gamble, which is funny because you made a Tenet joke a few minutes ago. Uh, number four, do you need a mentor to succeed as a writer in Hollywood? It's really interesting. Picture of uh, Mr. Miyagi in that. <laughs> and number five, DPA's 4097 core interview kit makes quality audio ENG work easy. Boy, that is a really solid representation <laughs> yes, of what thank you guys you. cover. That. Uh, I think that yeah. means that we're doing what we're supposed to do. You serve everyone at every level and on every depth. If it's technical, if it's storytelling, if it's kind of aspirational as to what big filmmakers do, if it's more strategic, the mentor stuff, you know, if it's low budget filmmaking. So I think at the very least, you should follow No Film School on Twitter because I feel like I learned 90% of what I know about the film industry from reading your tweets. <laughs> You're too kind. Uh, thank you. And more over than that, it's not, this is not, it's not me. It's Ryan Koo, CEO, founder, um, V. Renee, who's our managing editor, Jason Hellerman, senior writer, Darren James, our tech writer. Like we have a really, it's a really good team that does most of that stuff. And uh, the, and tons of contributors, um, which of which anybody listening or anybody is ever available to become because we love to publish stuff by filmmakers like the credo of no film school is by filmmakers for filmmakers and like we've been talking about this whole time it's really been a perfect topic for me to talk about because the goal of no film school is to get filmmakers teaching one another in a community or talking about what's happening in our community and not just us saying like hey we know and here we're going to tell you, you know, like that's not... George, you know. would you say that like contributing an article is kind of a backdoor way into promoting yourself, right? Yeah. Could you be like, oh, you know, here are the five incredible indie films out of South by Southwest. And one of them happens to be mine. Um, you know what I mean? Or like, none of them are mine, but this is why but, I'm excited but I that wish, I joined. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was alongside them. Yeah, we've had, yeah, yeah. I feel like we have like, I almost call them like no film school graduates or like, <laughs> like there's like people who've worked at, worked with no film school, written for no film school, who have made films, who have moved, who still sometimes contribute, but have gone through various programs at like the Sundances or the whatevers and have like put out features. We've also had like, I interviewed a filmmaker at Sundance and she was like, oh, I've been, re I learned everything on No Film School. Like, so we've, it's been around long enough that there's been tiers of people. Um, sometimes we'll interview a working DP who's like, oh, I love, I love it. I read it all the time. Like, and that's awesome. But it, awesome from an ego standpoint, but more so from like uh, the community is engaged. And look, filmmakers, a lot of filmmakers used to get into it by writing about film. Like that's what Cahe de Cinema was. Like these guys were writing about film. Like Quentin Tarantino right now is like writing great stuff every, not every day, but regularly on his new Beverly blog, which I love, about film and about great filmmakers. And like that's like... That's so much of the juice, you know? So I think it's a great way. Like, contribute a piece that's not about your film. Contact us about that. And then maybe when you have a film, pitch that, you know? I once wrote an article for, a very short article for Movie Maker Magazine about why I had such a great time at the Florida Film Festival. And it was really kind of about, they were covering very other kind of smaller quality yeah. festivals. And my movie played there. That's why I went there. So I, you know, I would mentioned it, obviously, in the article. So it's like, was... A little tiny bit of self-promotion, but it was really more about the festival and kind of why you should submit your film. There. I, yeah, I, you I can it, imagine. See, like, that's the kind of thing where if I saw a story about why you might like the Florida Film Festival, but I didn't but it was not written by a filmmaker. I would sort of wonder, like, well, is it motivated by the Florida Film Festival? <laughs> like, but if it's by a filmmaker who went there, then it immediately catches the attention of the other filmmakers. So we kind of need, it's like the lifeblood, like you kind of need the filmmakers to engage and in the community and contribute when they can. Um, and not just as interview subjects, because that's who the other filmmakers want to learn from, you know? My final question, and I apologize if you get this question a hundred times a day. Did you go to film school? Sort of. <laughs> I don't get it a hundred times a day, but so I was an undergraduate. 
I majored in visual arts, art history, film production. Like it was kind of a, a quasi, but I did do film things, like actual film things. I was very lucky. I got to shoot on film and edit on a Steenbeck, which was amazing. But um, I also got like, I got a very no film school, graduate film school experience. One of my very good friends went to USC grad school for film and he was allowed to have me produce one of his projects. They were allowed to have one outside producer. And basically, you know, I wasn't paid, but I got to be around it and learn everything these guys were doing. Are you ninety thousand dollars right now? Though? <laughs> no, see, that's the thing. I got <laughs> the access. Cool. And I lo- met all that's these people, cool, and man. I worked on all their <laughs> projects, and like, so I, I really yeah. did like that. Was like a be in the building kind of thing, like, and I, I wish more film schools opened that up that way. I don't know how they could, but like, that was pretty cool. Like. You know, because I didn't have to pay for it. Did you guys go? I went to USC undergrad like a chump. (laughs) Look, I loved it, but I am still paying for it. I went to UCLA, but I studied computer science and engineering. And then I moved to Silicon Valley. But when I moved back to LA, a friend of mine was going to AFI. And uh, I was the dolly grip, boom up, anything I could be on all of her short films. So Yeah, you were were in the AFI. Yeah, yeah. When I worked at Disney, I kind of... I brought on the DP that I'd met there, production designer and all these AFI people. But so I was really steeped in the production side of AFI, but I was not at all exposed to like the theory, you know, like some famous director is going to come talk to uh, this class. of. But this is like another thing that I think anybody still listening, still left out there, like find that like crew that you can get in where you can dolly grip and boom and like get and like learn from those other people because that's going to move you through. Yeah, you don't have to spend $100,000 to do that, <laughs> for sure. Well, George, are you are you down to do an unpaid endorsement with us? Yeah, absolutely. Unpaid endorsement. I got a good one, actually. It's a service called Indie. I think it's I-N-D-E-E. And they've got a free trial version, but you can also do the, the upgraded version. But it's basically like a screener system for your independent film. So say you want to send No Film School a screener, it'll customize the watermark, it'll set expiration dates. It's all like quite user-friendly and totally professional and really straightforward in terms of like sending different screeners to press outlets or people you want to like do virtual uh, note screenings or test screenings with. So it's like you know, it's slightly better than, say, a password protected Vimeo link in that it's got kind of the bells and whistles that you would expect from a professional style screening service. Um, but it's totally affordable and really easy. And we're using it uh, now on the, the feature and it's been really fun. So uh, Indie is the name of the company um, and it was really great. Cool. We have this thing that we're not using for this podcast, and we've sometimes used on the No Film School podcast, called the Rodecaster Pro, but it's it's a very cool device, and I highly... Look, it, who doesn't have a podcast at this point in the world, right? <laughs> Especially now, like everybody's at home, so you should be podcasting, but the Rodecaster Pro, I'm looking at it right now, and like this, it's just a really cool... It's like, it's plug and play, like literally. It, does, it makes it very easy for you to start podcasting at a pro level, uh, and you can call in guests. It doesn't sound super crisp, but it's it works. Um, is it like a Zoom type of thing, or is it more? No, it's just the audio. More than that, it's just the audio side. It's a yeah. Let me just. Or no, I mean the Zoom recorder. Oh Zoom yes, H. okay, yeah. Let me describe the. Uh, let me describe it. It's like a big kind of sound panel-y looking thing, and it's got a lot of buttons, and it's got like the dials. It's it's much more user friendly. Uh, Fisher Price, not in a bad way, but like then Zoom. Zoom is so tech, you know. It's like so, like little dials, little buttons, and you might, if you're not, if you're not super savvy to how to use a Zoom F8 or whatever, you might be intimidated, and you might need to read one of the posts on NoFilmSchool.com about how to use it. But the Roadcaster Pro is so like you take it out of the box, and the thing, like there's a big button that says record on it. Like it's like it doesn't make it difficult. And the levels are easy to monitor, and there's a lot of colors and big bu- big buttons. Like it's it's just like a fun, easy way to get into it and practice with it. And uh, I think you know filmmakers should be probably podcasting. Cool, Roadcaster Pro. What's your other thing? Yeah. Well, my other thing is going to be something that really doesn't need anybody's help. But HBO Max was released, and they have 
like the whole Turner Classic Movies library. Oh, so, that's cool though. Wait, I yeah, didn't know so, that. If I subscribe to HBO, do I get it free? It just fl- flips over. Yeah, man, so right? we you do have so the you ma- can just get it. You'll use your current subscription information. It's pretty easy. We have a post on nofilmschool.com about HBO Max and who gets it and why. <laughs> Matt's laughing really hard. But then, there is, uh, there's a lot of information about it and like what it's going to offer. But here's the thing for filmmakers. like Obviously, there's a lot of good stuff to watch. There's new stuff. There's new Looney Tunes. But t- Turner Classic Movies, like the library is, is huge. And there's some stuff you've heard of. There's Casablanca, but there's also like some foreign stuff on there. There's some Kurosawa stuff that people that lesser known. There's some international cinema, I should say, and uh, just like some deep cuts. But the best part is they haven't even put the whole library on yet. Right now, it's like the essentials. They're going to get into the deeper cuts over time. And I feel like for filmmakers, that's like a film school unto itself. That's rad, man. That's exciting. Wow. Yeah, I'll check that out. I wanted, wanted to endorse two... You know, I think I've talked about this already, but I'm getting really into Twitter <laughs> lately. I, like, just discovered Twitter. But uh, so two Twitter accounts that I follow. One is this guy um, at Action Movie Dad. He's kind of famous on YouTube, but he does all these, like, amazing tutorials for Red Giant. And his he works with Seth Worley, who's someone we've had on the podcast yeah, before. He, yes, that's great. If you're into visual effects at all, he just posts a ton of interesting stuff every day. So he's at Action Movie Dad, and he is also like a great filmmaker. The other person I've been obsessed with, and hopefully by the time this podcast comes out, he's still active, but his name is Andy Slavitt. He's either a statistician or an epidemiologist. He basically just writes about COVID-19, but every single night he does like a between 10 to 25 tweet summary of what happened that day. And just like in the pandemic he's like one of those guys that goes on like cnn a lot and talks hasn't about he things. been on the daily a few times too he, he's I probably think? been on the daily yeah, he's, yeah that he's sounds right because yeah. the name yes, rung, does, rung, does rings a bell for yeah. me for sure yeah but his analysis is really interesting and like when you know a lot of people will say like oh well in sweden the nobody died or you know georgia's un- under reporting or Anytime, like, you hear this thing kind of in the world that people are saying, like, well, there are more, more flu deaths or whatever, he is, like, the guy that'll be like, well, I'm going to call the ambassador of Sweden and get to the bottom of this. And let's yeah. <laughs> He is, like, very numbers science-based, and he's just, like, when people are unsure about something, he will go and try to figure it out. Dig and, it and, you know, cool. he has a That's slant, cool. of course, and all the comments on his tweets are like, you're just a, you know, whatever, sell out. But... I don't know. I love his the way he talks about it and the way he seems like very he doesn't tweet in pride. He's not like, well, we said that those beachgoers in Florida were going to get sick and now they're sick. He'll say like, hey, we were wrong about this. We're right about this. This is the trend we're seeing. And I'm just like obsessed with trying to figure out what the hell is going on with this pandemic. And if I could only read one thing about it a day, it would be his tweets. Andy Slavitt on Twitter. So that's it. Where can our listeners learn more about you? Uh, they can learn more about me on nofilmschool.com, which I've mentioned a few times, I think. And you also tweet. And stuff, I, right? I tweet, but I'm a weird person. <laughs> I, don't know, I don't know. My tweets might get like <laughs> off topic and strange. I don't know. I, I don't hold my tweets to the same level of <laughs> standards that I would maybe the site itself. Maybe this Fair is enough. a good pitch for my Twitter account. I don't know. Um, but go. yeah, go, go to No Film School. I, you know, I have a bio there. You can find more about me on Twitter or on, uh, I guess, Facebook and Instagram too. Um, but you're just going to see pictures of my kids, which hopefully you don't want to see. <laughs> Since I'm talking to the internet right now. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> awesome. Well, if you want to see all of the things that we talked about and check out the rest of uh, our topics, you can go to justshootapod.com. And we're also across all social media at Just Shoot a Pod. We're posting a lot of stuff lately. It's been pretty fun. Uh, and you can follow me at Mr. Matt Edlow. I'm at O. Kaplan on Instagram. I'm at Smitey Pileg on Twitter if you want to follow me. You don't have to. But Instagram is I think the place you can change that, you know, Warren. <laughs> I think you can change yeah, it. Yeah, but I can't get O. Kaplan, which is like, if I'm going to change it, okay. don't I want to change right. it for the same thing you, as everything you else? You do want to do that. Yeah, yeah, fair enough. Email us if you have <laughs> anything to say. Just shoot it pod at gmail.com. Our webmaster is Ewan Williams. The music you're listening to is from the Free Music Archive and the artist Jazar. Thanks for tuning in. We'll catch you next time. 